So we'll have you already. Right. Um, it's knowing where to start. I'll start at the beginning, and shall I? Yeah. I was born during the war. Crazy, yeah, they, they were in the next street. Wake up, wake up, Hitler's come to bombers. This is how, uh, how our young childhood was. I can't remember very much about the war, but we all lived in Bloomfield Street in Derby, which is gone now. It was a big house, but there was my mum, my stepfather, who was Irish, and I had a brother, an older brother, and my sister and my younger brother were half-sister and half-brother, because my mum had married again, I didn't know my dad. And then I can remember little bits about the war, soldiers, searchlights in the sky, and things like that. And shortly after the war, I can remember things like the anti-aircraft gun employ placements on the Arboretum and Alveston Park. You know, eventually they were all pulled down, but they had big guns. Uh, it's very little I can remember out of that. We lived in a big house, of course, things were different in them days, as your other granddad's probably told you. And there was my grandma, uh, my mum's mum, my step granddad, my mum, my stepdad, an auntie, a step auntie lived in. We all lived in the same house, you know, because it was a big house, four bedrooms, you know, and two big front rooms before you got right through the house. It was a big house with cellars underneath and a tunnel that went under the house, down steps and under the back, you know. And there was a front room big staircase, a middle room, which is a breakfast room, that's where I used to watch the searchlights in the sky at night, in the dark with the curtains back. But you had to sit in the dark to do it. And then you went back and there was a door to a side room, in a side passage, I mean, to go out into the garden, French doors there, down into the side, then another room at the back, which would have been a servant's room when it was built in about 1890 or something like that, or whenever it was. And then my aunt Nell, my aunt, she lived in Bateman Street, which was only three streets away. And she had the oldest son, Len, my cousin. He was older than me. He's gone now, he died in 1990. We were good friends. We were more like mates, even though he was older than me, you know, and he might have three daughters. And uh, I used to spend a lot of time with him. Because I, did I get to the stage where we used to keep pigs down the meadows? No. Didn't I? No. Oh, yeah. Well, Len was married and he had got Lynn, Janet and Jill. I used to babysit them. I mean, Janet came to see us about a couple of weeks ago. She's 64, I think, now, and Lynn's 65. She was two weeks old, younger than our William, born in 1953. And I used to babysit them when I was younger. <laughs> um, but anyway, Len was always had to be doing something. We either we used to go fishing, we went out pigeon shooting, got two shotguns, and then he got this yard we had a lot of interesting incidents, some I've thought of since I last spoke to you. I mean, once, the house they had in Bateman Street, at the end of the back garden, because his stepdad, because Len's dad died in the 1930s when Len was very young. He worked down the pits and he had an accident and he got cut and injured and he got septicemia and of course it killed him in them days. Yeah. Well, they call it sepsis now, but he said he was quite young and I, I was the only person to have a photo of his dad. And he was here one day and I showed him his phone. He says, my girls have never seen this, can I have it? I said, yeah. You know, that was about 1937, 38. Anyway, so one day they had a big attic in their house and we decided one day to build an aeroplane when they built them out of bolt sword. You see, so I went up there, we built it. You know, you could buy a little motor and put on it and fill it with spirit. And we thought we'd, we'd launch it because once we got this staircase, when you went to the top of the stairs, you had to open this door and it twisted up to this attic. You know, a proper attic, not like a, just a roof space, and built this bolts of wood and here a smashing job it was. The big wigs, I couldn't get it down the stairs, <laughs> so I take the windows off and we we opened the dormer window onto the roof and re put the wings back on and f flew it from there straight across the back garden onto the allotments at the back and it flew away beautifully. It didn't then crashed into the allotments, and wrecked it <laughs> after all that work. <laughs> yeah. And then eventually I started school in 1947 in Reginald Street, where you used to go to school, but in the infant side. Mm. And I was there for a couple of years, and eventually, I'll go back again in a bit, to St James's Church of England School on Dairy House Road. 
That's an ethnic Indian community centre now, or Pakistani or something. And then that was called St James's Church of England School. And then from there, I took a scholarship. Do you know what a scholarship is? 11 plus, as they called it in the olden days, if you want to go to grammar school, or if you pass to go to grammar school. So then I passed and went to Bemrose School, you know, the other side of Derby, which is Bemrose Community, the community school now. If not, I'd have gone to Reginald Street, where you went. It was called Reginald Street School in them days. Yeah, nearly all my mates went there, you see. But there was only two of us went to Bemrose. One went to Derby School, and I don't know how I passed the scholarship. And one went to Central School, which was in Darley Park. And my older brother, David, he took his 11 plus and failed it. And he was the cleverest one in the family. But when he was 13, you got a chance to take it again. And he took it again and he went to Central School. Have you ever heard of Central School? That, there was like three grammar schools. There was Derby, Bemrose, Central. And that was in Darley Park. It was an old country house, that was. Right in the middle of Darley Park. Beautiful it was. Anyway, I went to Bemrose, and, uh, which is quite daunting. When you're just given form for your bus fare, when you're 11, in your school cap, and your uniform, which cost a fortune, because you had to have all the proper gear to go to a grammar school. And when you get there, there's 120 of you assembled in the hall and allocated your classes to go to. My mate, the only other one I knew, went to another class and I was in another one. There was 30 in each class, roughly. And you all assembled in the hall and the first thing you saw was all the teachers and the headmaster in the black gowns and that on the stage and stood down the sides, you know, watching you and you thought, what am I doing here, <laughs> you know? It was quite daunting, you know. And you were put into d different streams then. You either learned German, Spanish, or French, or Latin. Top, the top group went into Latin. And that's how, how we started. And you just made friends with the other 29 in class because you didn't know anybody else, you know. And you were just in at the deep end. Nobody took you to school on your first day. Even when I started in the other schools. Not like it is now. You chauffeured about. You made your own way. <laughs> But you get over it. The reason I say I didn't, I puzzled. When I was at school, I was very average at St James's. You know, middle of the road, it was about 30 in the class, 32, and I was only about 14th or 15th. But exams never bothered me. Mm -hmm. And I took the exam and my mate Harold that lived in Bateman Street, we both passed. And the, the top group should pass really, shouldn't they? Because mm -hmm. it's a written sit down exam. So why do I pass and they fail? But Benrose, going back a bit, was a bit strict there. Because it was all boys. It was 750 lads at that school. <laughs> you know, and St James's Church School, that was all boys. Girls hadn't been invented till I left school. And uh, you, you could, there was no getting to know you with teachers or anything like that there. They were very strict. No first name terms or anything. You know, they, um, the only name I ever had in all the years I was there was Smith. You called them sir or madam, you know, and that was it. And if the headmaster came into sight, he tried to melt into the background somewhere because he was an ex-army officer. I never showed, I found my book, by the way, about Benrose. I never showed it, you did the last time. I couldn't find it, I'll show you in a bit when we've done. And uh, occasionally he used to take a class. He always wore a black gown. A lot of them did. And if an English teacher wasn't there or a maths teacher, somebody would come and take the class, you know, if they were off or something. And by God, he put the fear of God on you. Because if you weren't religious when you started there, you were when you left, because he put the fear of God in. <laughs> and uh, you couldn't get out of anything, you know, skiving out. We used to have woodwork and metalwork classes, and that was in Albany Road, opposite Memro School. We'd pass it when we pick your mum up from work and go past there, but it's a different now. And there was these prefabricated buildings. We used to have to go out to school across there to do woodwork. I was, did woodwork for a while and I did metal work. You know, they got lathes and drills and all that. The, the teachers never had much to do with you, like they used to set you a project and you did it, you know. Because half the time they were making wooden gates and wrought iron gates. I think they had a sideline going, <laughs> you know, and uh, the the, the uh, Woodwork teacher, his name was Hanlon. Never forget him. He was a humorless man as well. And the metalwork teacher, he was Saunders. He helped me fly him once because I broke a drill once when I was drilling this metal. And I broke the drill bit, you know, in one of these roller it. Of course, I broke the bit. <laughs> he knocked me flying. Get out, too much pressure. But Hanlon, he was a hunchback. 
you know, he had one back, he did. <laughs> And when he disappeared from class one day, we all had his individual benches where we were working with the vice on. And we used to have these, you know, you get standing knives now. We had wooden ones then with an interchangeable blade and you screwed it in for marking out the wood. And, uh, and we were playing darts against the door <laughs> as he opened the door one day. And he didn't take kindly to that either. <laughs> we were throwing these knives into the door. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, when I left school, I went to work. Harold just left before me, my mate Harold. And he went to work at the carriage and wagon works, Bombardier now. Which was a lot different in them days, with all the old carriages and the old fashioned wagons, you know, and it was like a grease pit everywhere. where Martin worked, he dad. But it was different in them days, there were loads of sheds where they did all the different repairs. And I wanted a job and didn't know what I wanted to do. And Harold says, you want to come get a job at the railway? It's all right, cushy number there in the offices. I thought, that'll do me. Don't want to get my hands dirty. Of course, you could walk into an apprenticeship quite easy in them days and get jobs. It was a lot easier than it is now. So I, I left and went to the railway, knocked on the door. Well, you go to the, the front uh, gates and the security men send you up to the office and the chief clerk comes out and said, you can have a job in the office, like, come down here. So I went down and the first thing you had to do was sit a written exam. You had to do English, maths and general knowledge. They put me in what they call U-shop office. And I went over there and I worked there for a few months. I packed my paper round up. And a few months later, Arthur Warman, who run the paper shop up the corner, couldn't get anybody else to do it, so he came back. Bear in mind, I started at four pound a week then, eight pound for a fortnight, you paid fortnight. Of course, you were classed as staff, you see. Which was good money then, apprentice only got about one pound 25. And he says, I can't get me, will you come back and do your paper round again for a bit? So I said, yeah, so I thought, I used to do it before I went to work. I made another 10 bob a week. And uh, I was in the U shop for a while. But it was a uh, was very strict atmosphere because it was always the hierarchy. There was no familiarity between the upper people, you know. And I used to have to do things where I used to have to go into the works manager's office and the deputy managers, which were the top men. You know, but they never spoke to you. Because yeah. I used to have to go and alter things on monitoring boards where stuff was and keep a check of where all the wagons and the carriages was at, you know where around the work anyway after a while I got fed up so I left and I went to work at Woolworths and I went into a job which was laughingly called a trainee manager you know but you started at the bottom but that was the system then you started in the basement or the, the you know below stairs and worked your way up you know you did all the labouring manual jobs and everything going really and that was very strict there, but eventually, if you stuck it out, you get promoted to a floorman, which is a under manager. And there was a massive basement under the floors and another one up above. I worked in the offices. Of course, you started working there on a Saturday, and that's how we met. Isn't it, dear? Yes, dear. <laughs> and uh, eventually got married. Then I decided when we got married, we got to earn more money. So I went to work on the buses. I went on the Trent Motor Traction, as you do as it was them days. Of course, you got a full wage straight away. Val went on the following year, didn't you? I went on there in 1916. You went on in 61. And I was a conductor. Then I went to be a driver, passed my test as a driver in 1964. And then uh, somebody who died recently persuaded me to become a timekeeper. There was two jobs, it was inspectors and timekeepers to be a timekeeper, which was a better job than a driver. So I thought, I'll do that. The driver, a timekeeper, had to start at court to five in the morning when the first bus had started, if you're on early shift, till court to 12. And that, or was it court to two? I forget, just forget now. But you had the keys to unlock the place and that, so you had to be there. And if any driver didn't come in, or a conductor, or conductors didn't come, you had to make sure their shifts was covered and allocate the jobs and overtime and all that sort of thing, you know. And if somebody didn't turn in, they overslept or phoned in, you've got to make sure their job was covered. And I did that for a while, but I got fed up with that job. Because I nearly caused a strike once, but that's another story, I won't go into that. What? <laughs> I nearly caused a strike. Um, so then a friend of mine worked on the Pearl Insurance Company. This is a brief resume of all the lifespan. And the... Uh, while I was still on the buses, he said, he interested in a job? That was Keith Lennon. I'll show you the picture on my phone in a bit, Keith. Because he got promoted to assistant manager. 
And he says, good job, do you want to go in or, you know? And I thought, I thought yeah, all right. So I went for an interview, I had to have an interview with the manager in Derby. Very formal, Fred Knight, he'd been an ex-prisoner of war, the Japanese he had. He, it was always, never first name terms with him. Always a three-piece suit and very, and your surname, you're always known as Mr. Smith. Never formal, you know, good bloke. And I thought about it, I got the job, you had to go to Nottingham for another interview. And I started, and of course I stayed there for 30 years nearly, which was the right thing to do really. <coughs> because I left there 22 years ago, and they still pay me my pension now, so. <laughs> so I went out, I, I still kept my bus driver's license going. And I went to, a friend of mine worked on a river, I thought, well I want another job to tide me over. Because I actually left the insurance company when I was 54, my 54th birthday. And I went down to the bus company and I said, and John, yeah, you got a license? I said, yeah. He said, we can start Monday. I said, that'll do. So I went in under my notice and I left on my birthday on the Friday and started to work on the buses on the Monday. And uh, they sent me out route learning the next day and to get some uniform. The day after, by Friday, I was supposed to start refreshing again. And there were that short of drivers. They sent me straight out on the road. And that was the end of it. So after, once the crisis is over, we'll put you back in, you know, I never did happen, but that's how it is on the buses, you know. If you can drive, and once you leave the, the stand, they're not bothered anymore, get on with it. <laughs> but uh, the Trent was the best years. It was a very good job in those days. It wasn't as, as leery as it is now. Because we did, on the on a river, you do stick to the same routes pretty well. But we didn't on the Trent. You did every route on the schedules. You did everything. When you started, you did, if it was a run to Melbourne, you did to Melbourne. If it was to Swaddling Coat, if it was to Manchester, you know, you did it, yeah. And eventually you could move up to, where you could do runs for private parties up to 50 mile radius. But and eventually you could even do further than that. But I've been to Great Yarmouth and Grimsby and Cleethorpes at quarter of an hour's notice because they hadn't got anybody else in that group to do it. So they still saying you're just the same. You know, you'll, you'll work it out on the way. <laughs> Well, I was on overtime in the morning from six o'clock till nine, and uh, up until eight o'clock, I hadn't done anything. And then all of a sudden, I was given this call out. You were called out over a tannoy. Hey, what? There's somebody not coming in at quarter past eight, like. Take that bus to Grimsby and Cleethorpes. So I've never been to Grimsby and Cleethorpes. So you'll be all right. Bob Garrett, the conductor who does several buses, he know he goes every week. So I'm all right. So I said, well, I'll never wait to Lincoln. I'll be all right there. So I went up to Lincoln. When I gets to Lincoln, I shouts Bob and said, where do we go now, Bob? And he says, do you know? I don't know. <laughs> he says, I, I, I get my head down when I get this far. I've collected all the money because there's nothing else to do. I don't take any notice. So I said, well, I'll find it myself then. So I kept going. And uh, there's a chap sat behind me with his family on the two front seats telling everybody else on the bus that uh, over 15 years he's never been this way before. <laughs> And I'm thinking, shut up, we'll get there eventually, <laughs> which we did. So we did the drops in Grimsby, Cleethorpe, reloaded, set off back. And uh, when I got back to Derby about six o'clock, my late shift, somebody else was doing it. So the timekeeper said, have a sandwich and that, and, and give me another job. He said, get a coach, they were in the bus park, you see, and go to the station, Midland Hotel, and take this party to Chatsworth, which I didn't know what it was for, until I get there and it's the present Duke's 21st birthday party. I think it was 1964 or 65, something like that. And uh, all these people were having a great time because it was a beautiful evening. And when we get there, Princess Margaret was there, 1,800 guests, a military band, chauffeurs, Rolls Royce, Bentleys. They gave us refreshments by somebody very distinguished. I don't know who he was. <laughs> and uh, when I came back at night, after midnight, after the firework display, and they'd had a whale of a time, we just sit around most of the time waiting to come back. And when I got back to Derby, it must have been about one o'clock in the morning. And they gave me about eight pound tip because they had a great time. They thought Chats was beautiful. It was a lovely summer's evening. So I tell everybody I went to the Duke's 21st birthday party. But in those days, we used to have a lot of outings on the buses. And uh, I was in one club, which was called the B&B &B Outing Club. We used to pay half a crown a week into that. And there's two blokes, it's called B&B, &B, because the two bloke drivers that run it was Birdie, this was nickname, his real name was Albert, Birdie Bennett and Billy Bull. <laughs> and they run it, and the, the Trent would give you a coach for free when you ordered a trip. 
and we used to go off. It was men only, not women. They had their own outings, they did. Of course, they were all clippies. But they could have male conductors and male drivers, but no women went. And we went to places like the oil refinery at El Ellesmere Port. They were always boozy doos, and they used to take you on a trip all around the, the works and show you. We went to um, Vauxhall Car Factory, the production line, the Vauxhalls were turned on Vauxhall Velixes and Wyverns and all that in them days. And uh, we've been to Bruce, Truman's Brewery, Watney's Brewery. And they plough you up with plenty of beer then. They also used to give you a meal as well. And then on the way back, we'd stop at a pub somewhere and there'd be food laid on again at night, get back in the early hours of the morning. And they'd get up about two hours later and go to work. <laughs> we had some good trips. Yeah, we went to Triple X Glass Factory. We used to have them quite regularly, didn't we? And then we used to have other outings that were mixed, didn't we? We used to go to London, didn't we? Tower of London and things like that. And in those days, when you went on an outing, you didn't go casual, you went in a suit and collar and tie like your granddad did, <laughs> didn't you? Yeah. you know, not like you would do now. We went around the Tower of London, didn't we? And played and batty, see fun fair, we're in a suit. <laughs> Well, Ray, who died five years ago, my mate, and his wife, Val, another Val, said to us one day, Val worked for the NHS, didn't she, in the offices somewhere, the executive council somewhere. Yeah. He says, do you fancy going abroad on holiday? So we said, yeah. He says, we'll go to Italy. He says, all right. Well, Val's family lived in Kent. So we said, yeah, we'll hire a Volkswagen Caravette and we'll, we'll go overland. So we agreed to do it, didn't we? Saved up some money, which is a lot cheaper in them days. So we went nigh this Vauxhall, Volkswagen Caravette and, uh, from Sandy Acre and I think was it Saturday morning we set off, Friday or Saturday, we had two weeks holiday. So we drove down to Kent, the four of us, stayed at overnight till the early hours of the morning at the farm, they had a beautiful farm in Kent, Mel's family did, with a very old medieval farmhouse, which her brother still lives in, Phil, and uh, two staircases in it and a beautiful old place. Anyway. Yeah, 1490 or something like that. Anyway, we uh, stayed overnight. The next day, we got up about six o'clock, drove to Dover, got on the ferry to, to Cali, and then we just all we'd got was a series of AA maps with no plans at all. And we drove across France, stopped at campsites, and campsites in those days were pretty basic, you know, because you just stopped at a farm that advertised camping with a picture of a tent, and they didn't speak English. There was usually a French lady who would so, so much a night, so many French francs, and that was it. And then we drove to Switzerland, stopped again in Switzerland on Lake Geneva, was it? Lake Geneva? One of the lakes, anyway. Camped overnight, and then we drove over the Alps. No, Vivi. Was Vivi, was it? I think we stopped at Boat, didn't we? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of lakes over there. And we went over the St Bernard Pass, which is 13,000 feet, and I can't stand the heights. <laughs> you can see you're nearly eye level with cable cars, you are. And you, you know, Thousand feet down, you're looking. Anyway, I don't like it, but still, beautiful views, absolutely beautiful. And then we drove over the Alps, and then you dropped down into Italy. But while we were at the top of the Alps, we stopped on this country. We had a photo somewhere of them slides we've got. We've still got slides for the pit. When you got sweaters on, because it was cold and there was snow at the side of the road, and we went to the that stream, didn't we? And had cups of cold ice, cold water. And then within two hours, we'd drop down the other side into Italy and you were putting shorts and a T-shirt on. Yeah, I said, yeah. boy, <laughs> and then I forget, where did we stop? But the first night at uh, Spimanti, Asti, Asti. We stopped on a campsite at Asti, which was like a sports field, but you could camp there. We went and bought that wine, didn't we? We didn't know much about wine, so we went to this wine shop. They didn't know much, they didn't lie, yeah. Asti, Spimanti. Thought, this'll be all right. I thought, dear, that was horrible. And the campsite was beautiful, wasn't it? Really beautiful. And, and the, the night, at spot on eight o'clock, all of a sudden this noise started up. Noise started up and you thought, it's electrical wires, something buzzing. And it's crickets. And it's just like somebody throws a switch. And it, and it starts this noise, doesn't it? All these crickets at that time of night. Anyway, we spent a fortnight in this caravan, slept in it, the four of us. Then we take it in. If anybody had to get up in the night to go to the bathroom, we all had to get up. <laughs> and we went and we finished up at Kiavari, didn't we? Mm. And on Kiavari, it was beautiful, right next to the beach. 
And uh, the sea was beautiful. I've never been before like I'd never been on one holiday before that in my life. And I got burnt just like a lobster because I never put any sun cream on. And we were in and out of the sea all day. And uh, we had a great time, didn't we? And then we set off back and we came back a different way over the St. Gotthard Pass, didn't we? Came back a different way. But we just made the route up as we went along. And there was a chap camped next to us, Joseph, Joseph. Italian, wasn't he? Bull. And Bull, his dog, Bull, Bull. He didn't speak a word of English. And he went out, put all his, he slept in his car because you camped under vines. They had all these vines, didn't they? Mm. And you drove underneath them to keep the sun off the shade. And he came, he came out and he got all this wetsuit gear on and a, and a spear gun, harpoon gun. Goes off, plods off down to the sea. I left the dog there. And he comes back a bit later on, didn't he? And he caught a squid, a big squid, hadn't he? Mm. And then he came round to all of us, borrowing various utensils, <laughs> borrowing bits. And there was some French couple next to me, a little girl. They didn't speak any, didn't they? And the little girl, her name was Susie. Yeah, yeah Susie's mummy. And uh, But they didn't speak English or anything, you know, but we got on all right. And then he went and cooked this squid, didn't he? And then he was coming around offering us some of this squid. He thought, oh, no, thanks very much. <laughs> he come morning salt, pepper and all sorts of mm -hmm. stuff. But it was good. The first Coca-Cola ever had was there in Kiavari. And they had a machine on the side, didn't they, next to that little restaurant where you could go and eat spaghetti and spaghetti bolognese and all that sort of stuff. And you had to put a hundred lira coin into the machine and you got a bottle, a tall slim bottle, of ice cold Coke. And the bottle, a hundred lira, was I think the equivalent now of 6p, would it be? Yeah, of course, hundred, yeah, about one and twopence, wasn't it? And, you know, and the shilling was five, 5p, five so it was about 6p for a bottle. Ice cold, it was beautiful.